I want to introduce Green's functions using a simple example, but uh, with in-depth investigation in many different perspectives. And uh, along the way, I'm going to talk about delta functions and uh, Green's functions of the Laplacian and Poisson problem and all that. And uh, because of this simple example, it should be easy for you to understand what should happen for the uh, more complex case. All right, the example I want to talk about is this simple uh, second order constant coefficient linear non-homogeneous differential equation. And uh, you see y double prime plus y equals to zero has a solution sine x and cosine x, right? And this is just one step harder, uh, which is you have some function on the right side instead of zero. Now for that case, you've learned hopefully in differential equations class that you have this variation of parameters formula where the denominator is called the Ronskian calculated using this formula. And this integral should give you one solution that would satisfy this differential equation. Now let's actually do the calculation and see what we, we have. As I said, uh, the solutions are cosine x. See, uh, if you move the y to the other side, it basically says that you need a function whose second derivative is negative of itself. Uh, and cosine x and sine x are perfect functions that satisfies those description. The Ronskian is calculated here. It's, it's simple. It's just 1 because of cosine squared plus sine squared equal to 1. And therefore, if you replace the denominator by 1 and y2 as the sine x and y1 as cosine x, you end up with this simple formula. Now, we want to work with this so that it becomes something more like a Green's function. So first, what you want to do is replace this integration by x as integration for dt. And uh, when I do this, I'm assuming that f of t goes to 0 uh, at negative infinity. Well, we're going to also assume that f of x goes to 0 when x is taken to infinity as well. Okay, so under those endpoint conditions, you can replace the above integral as this one. Well, this one ha have plus c, this one wouldn't. But nonetheless, it will be one of the antiderivatives of this function because you take the antiderivative, you plug in the x and negative infinity, and because this goes to 0 to at negative infinity, it's going to be 0 here. So you just get some antiderivative of this function. And uh, so you should be able to see that these two will produce uh, almost the same kind of solutions. Uh, maybe some differences will be some plus c1 here, plus c2 there. Uh, but still, you, you just get some uh, particular solution. Okay, so the reason I want to do this is so that I can move the cosine x and sine x into the integral. Now, it wasn't possible before because you're integrating by dx, and when you have a function of x, you can't make it go in or out. But here, because you're integrating by dt, cosine x can freely go in. And uh, once you see that the two integrals can now be put into a single integral, and then we can use uh, the formula sine a minus b is equal to sine a cosine b minus sine b cosine a. And you look at this after factoring the ft out, you see that uh, this formula uh, makes the for formula that we have even simpler. Okay, This is y as integral of ft sine x minus t dt from negative infinity to x. So we have this simple formula for the solution of this. And this was obtained just by uh, all the, the math that we know from uh, just the first differential equations class that you, you took. Okay. Uh, but now I'm going to ask a question uh, that seems so obvious, but uh, it's not so easy to answer. Uh, the question is, how do you know that this actually is a solution to this differential equation? Well, uh, one way to do it is to do
do the exact opposite of what we did. So you expand the sine x minus t as this one, and then you you split that into two integrals, move it out, and then you can differentiate using the the chain rule and not the chain rule, but a product rule, and eventually you will get the answer. Uh, but uh, that that doesn't sound so fun. Okay, and I want to show you two other methods of verifying that this is indeed a solution and it's this method three where we are going to learn uh, that indeed what's in this formula hidden in this formula is actually the Green's function for this differential equation but I plead you to still to still look at method two because uh, this will assure you that indeed this is a solution to that and <clears throat> once you get to method three uh, you will have um, much more confidence in understanding why we have the Green's function, okay? All right, so let's go with the method two first. So we have um, this equation, and we need to find the derivative. And the problem with this function is that it's not so easy to differentiate. You see, uh, you probably had cases where you have x in the range and you can differentiate, well, that was called the uh, second fundamental theorem of the calculus. So maybe you might remember a formula like the following. You, you have, a, if you have a function of t and you integrate from 0 to x dt, and if you, inter if you differentiate this by, by x, then you end up with f of x. That was called the second fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, but <laughs> here the problem is uh, not only you have an x here, but you have another x here. So how can you differentiate both at the same time? And that's when the idea of multivariable calculus comes in. So uh, what you want to do is for the moment, you want to distinguish these two x's. Call the first one as u and the other one as v. And then... Uh, y could be just f of x x where u is replaced by x and v is replaced by x okay then uh, the the question of y prime simply becomes a question about what is the uh, what is the derivative using the chain rule of multivariable calculus all right so i'm using the chain rule of multivariable calculus uh, it goes like this. See, f is function of u and v, and u is equal to x. So u is a function of x, and v is also equal to x, so v is a function of x. And the dependence diagram goes like f is a function of u and v, and they're both functions of x. And therefore, if you want to know how f changes under the changes in x, uh, the multivariable chain rule says, well, there are two ways that x influences f. Uh, the first way that x influ influences f is uh, you have to measure how f changes under the changes in u and multiply that by how u changes under changes in x. But that's not all because x influences change of, of f in two different ways. So you have to account for the other way that change of x can change f, which is uh, f will go through v. So change of x is going to bring change in v, and change in v is going to ch bring change in f. So uh, you end up with this, this ch multivariable chain rule, and because here du dx is simply 1, and dv dx is also just 1, uh, we can say that uh, uh, du dx and dv dx are 1 and just write, write this down. Okay, so that's just the multivariable chain rule that we just figured out. Uh, but what is derivative of f with respect to derivative of u? Now, this is much better than before because uh, this v is, v is different from u. And therefore, when you differentiate this by u, you can just use the second fundamental theorem of the calculus, which says that uh, all you have to do is 
your t the t's should be replaced by u. So your t's are replaced by u, and this is what you get. Okay. On the other hand, differentiating by v means uh, you, you can just uh, take the derivative operator of v into the integral and apply that to sine because the sine differentiates to cosine you get this formula all right so that's how you you get your derivative using the multivariable chain rule and other knowledge that you know from calculus 2 and uh, that means that you have uh, integral of negative infinity to x of ft cosine x minus t and that's after you plug in v is x and u is x so if you plug in x and x here you get sine of zero but sine of zero is zero so the first thing goes away this first term goes away and uh, replacing u and v by x is, is, as a result you get this okay so that's the the first derivative now if you have the first derivative then you can do a similar calculation using the second derivative. And I really plead you to sit down and see uh, how to do the second derivative. Uh, the calculation is very similar to what we just did. The only, except, only difference is that uh, at some point you get cosine of 0, which is 1, and that's why this time your fx survives. And uh, uh, you get this as the result. But if you look at this, this second part here is really the original function y, right? So it re it's really saying y double prime is f of x minus y, and you bring the y to the left side, and you get this equation, which is exactly the differential equation we're trying to solve. So we just proved that uh, this function indeed gives you a solution to this original equation by using the multivariable chain rule. Okay, that's method two. Now that you have some confidence that this is indeed the, the solution, uh, let's try a different approach. The second approach is what uh, second approach is to use what we call the heaviside step function. So this heaviside step function is a very simple looking function. If you look at the graph, it's like it's one after zero, but zero. Uh, before zero. So it's zero here and one afterwards. And here I wrote down that theta of zero is one. That's not so important, but there are some other conventions. Uh, some, some people want the theta of uh, zero to be one half, and that could be another one. But let's, uh, let's just use this one. It doesn't really make much of a difference between what value you take at theta of zero. But anyways, this theta is called a heavy side function. Um, it gives you one. And what that means is that if you have theta of x minus t, uh, then whenever x minus t is positive, it's one. And whenever x minus t is negative, it's zero. And what that means is this is what t is less than x, right? So when t is less than no, actually, t is greater than x. Yeah. So when t is greater than x, it's 0. And when t is less or equal to x, it's 1. So you can see that uh, if you do the, this integral, then integ if you break up this integral into two parts, integral from negative infinity to x uh, plus integral from x to infinity, the theta function becomes 1 in here because it, it's this first case. Uh, whereas in the second part, uh, the uh, theta function becomes zero. So zero times anything is zero. So this second integral actually goes away. And if this is just one in here, that's exactly the same as the previous integral. Okay? So, you, so the second idea is to move this x into this integral by use of this uh, theta function. And you kind of see why you would want this, right? Because uh, if we had x in two different places like this, uh, differentiating was uh, not a simple task because you need to 
use multivariable chain rule. But if, if there was a way to move this x inside, uh, then uh, you don't have to worry about that, and you can just differentiate by x without any consideration for the second fundamental rule, uh, second fundamental theorem of the calculus. So uh, it, this is a nice idea, right? Okay, so let's move on. Uh, before I move on, actually, there's uh, something I, I want to say about the derivative. See, if I differentiate this because of the product rule, at some point you will have to differentiate theta. But there's something, something funny about theta because this has a jump discontinuity at zero, and it's basically horizontal lines except, uh, except at zero. Uh, the derivative is always zero, except at x equal to zero. And uh, uh, if you just take the theorems and knowledge from calculus one, you are probably taught that uh, in this case, the function is not differentiable at zero because there's a uh, jump discontinuity. And you learn that any time a function is not continuous, its derivative is undefined. You can't differentiate it. It's not differentiable. And, and therefore, uh, you, you have this theta function whose derivative is called the delta of x. It's a function which is 0 everywhere except at x equal to 0. In calculus 1 knowledge, you would say, oh, this is undefined at 0. But uh, this has some strange properties. And the strange property is that uh, we're going to think about delta of 0 as infinity. Uh, and that's because, that's because if, you, if you take this theta x as sequence of approximating functions, which is like 0 before, but then it goes, it sharply goes up and becomes 1. And uh, you, you, you make this, this turn sharper and sharper, and eventually it becomes this theta function. Then the derivative, uh, derivative, derivative, will look like something like this. It will be zero everywhere, but then suddenly there's a sharp turn, so the there's a steep increase, and it becomes like that. So uh, this delta function is a, a sequence of functions that that looks like this sharp bump. At zero, so uh, at the limit, you think of this delta function as something that's like like this, and that goes to infinity and then comes back. That that's the way you imagine this delta function. And uh, <clears throat> so, so what kind of property does this delta function have? Well, you think of this delta function to have integral from negative infinity to infinity as 1. In fact, if you have any interval that contains 0 from negative 1 to 1 or negative 0 0.1 to 0 0.1, you always consider its integral to be 1. In other words, this, this uh, one place where delta becomes infinity, we think of the area under that infinity as exactly 1. And because of that, uh, if you integrate a function and uh, if if uh, you integrate a function where the interval contains zero like this one then uh, it basically magnifies the value of f of zero over anything else so it ignores the value of f for everything else except that f of zero it, it takes this value and uh, so, so because uh, delta of x is 0 other than x equal to 0, this is the same thing as integral from negative 1 to 1 of delta x of f of 0 dx. And uh, you bring the fx, f of 0 outside, and you end up with the integral of this delta x, which is 1, and 1 times f of 0 is f of 0. So you end up with f of 0 as the result. So, uh, sorry, this handwriting is a little small, but what I'm trying to say is that uh, integral of g of x, any function, t 
times delta of x integrated from negative infinity to infinity just picks up the value of g of x at 0. Okay? Uh, that is the way that physicists and engineers like to argue. But because this kind of argument makes mathematicians not so comfortable, uh, they try to justify this by using integration by parts. So uh, you can integrate by parts and get a similar result, which is like you integrate delta of x, and because the antiderivative is our heavy side step function, you you get the heavy side step function, and then uh, you have uh, you have to apply minus of the you differentiate the other one that you did not differentiate, so you get this g prime of x times the heavy side function, and uh, like before, we are assuming that g of x has the boundary conditions that g of negative infinity is zero and g of infinity is zero, okay? And uh, if that's true, then you can uh, plug in infinity and negative infinity into this function and get, get zero for both cases, so you get zero. On the other hand, be, uh, because uh, theta of x is one from zero to infinity, you can rewrite this, or you can break this integral into two from negative infinity to zero and zero to infinity, and the one from 0 to infinity is 1, whereas uh, integral from negative infinity to, to 0 is 0. So you only get the integral from 0 to infinity. And uh, the antiderivative of g prime of x is, of course, g of x. And you plug in the endpoints, and you get this. And because, again, from our uh, assumption about the boundary condition, uh, it just gives you g of 0. So you get the same result as physicists and engineers do. and uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, this is how you do it. Now, this is still not a completely mathematically reverse way of argue, arguing. So if you're a math major and you really want to see how this can be made rigorous, uh, then these things are called uh, distributions. So delta function is an example of what we call distributions. And distributions are dual to a function space called Schwarz class. This is all math talk, so you don't have to know the word Schwarz class, but Schwarz class are class of functions which is differentiable infinitely and uh, it decays to zero faster than any polynomial uh, as uh, x goes to infinity or x goes to negative infinity. And dual to the Schwarz class, the dual class of functions to the Schwarz class is called distributions, and you can formally assign the value of uh, this integral at g of 0, and it just works perfectly for the Schwarz class functions. So that, that's just a side note for math majors out there who is interested in this. But uh, for other people, uh, you should just be content with the physics explanation or this integration by parts explanation. All right, so let's continue. <clears throat> so back to our, uh, our thing here, we uh, have this formula and we really want to show that this is the solution to the above equation and uh, you differentiate by x and because x is here and here you just have to use the product rule for these products and that's what you get and you see the at theta prime as I said before and that's going to be a delta function now if this is a delta function what happens is that it just picks up when yeah, so what happens is that this becomes delta of x minus t. So uh, when this thing becomes 0, uh, it picks up the value of this function that's multiplied. So if you look at what's multiplied to this delta function, it's these two functions, right? And uh, if, you, if you have x minus t equals to 0, then you have x equals to t. So you see that uh, uh, integrating f t sine x minus t times delta of x minus t from negative infinity to infinity is same as replacing t by x. When t is x, you have uh, well that this this will this role is just to make sure that x is equal to t, so that we don't have to to uh, worry about. 
it's really t equals to x for these two functions. So this t becomes x, and this t also becomes x, but sine of 0 is what? That's sine 0, which is just 0, right? And therefore, uh, you can uh, just ignore this. That will be just 0, and you just have to differentiate this one. Now, if you do the same kind of work for y double prime, again, using the, the product rule, then the product rule will give you the second term, this time with cosine of 0. And because cosine of 0 is 1, you're going to get uh, y double prime equals to negative y plus f of x, and now you get y double prime plus y equals to f of x. So, uh, see, this is much easier than what we did before, uh, because now we're thinking of theta uh, as the heavy side function, the derivative is the delta function. So just knowing that enables you to uh, find the, the uh, evaluate that this is indeed a solution to the above equation much faster. So that's what's so great about delta functions. Okay, so now go back and let's recap. Uh, what we did was we verify that this is indeed the solution of this uh, with the usage of this uh, heavy side step function. And <clears throat> what I want to say is that this right side actually looks like a convolution. So definition of a convolution of two functions is that if you have two functions fx and gx, and then computing this from negative infinity to infinity is called the convolution of the two functions. And because this is the convolution, you can say that uh, uh, this above solution is basically the convolution of fx and sine x theta x, right? It's exact. If you think of this, this function as sine x theta x with x replaced by uh, x minus t, then uh, it is exactly this integration formula. So this convolution is this integration formula. And uh, when you are able to write the solution as the function on the right side convoluted with another function, this function is called the Green's function. Okay? And it's called the Green's function for the operator uh, double y double prime plus uh, y. Well, I wrote it as second de derivative plus 1 because if you multiply this to y, then this hits y to get produce the y double prime, and 1 times y produces y. So uh, indeed, you see that ly is exactly this. So this differential equation can be written in this way. And uh, I'm just saying that the solution of this can be represented as fx convoluted with this Green's function, where this Green's function takes this form. Okay, uh, and and uh, uh, this is kind of like saying that g of x, this Green's function, is the kernel of the integral operator. See, this is an integral operator for a function, right? If you give provide a function, then it integrates it to give you back another function, right? So it's a kernel of an of an integral operator, which is the inverse of this operator. And that's what it is. Green's functions are defined for uh, all kinds of derivative operators, uh, where it become it's really the kernel of that uh, integral operator. Okay. Um, now, let's do the exact same cal calculation using delta functions, and this time uh, you, you'll you'll find it very easy to verify the. Uh, that this is indeed a solution. Oh. Um, so first, what you want to know is that you, you need to understand the characteristics of this Green's function. See, this Green's function itself, if you differentiate using the product rule, the der derivative of the theta is the delta x, and because this is the same thing as delta of 0, uh, but sine of 0 is 0, so you just ha end up with this. Okay. Uh, see, uh, Yes, yeah, so, so what I'm trying to say is that if you have a function times delta of x, that's the same thing as f of 0 of delta of x because uh, delta is delta of anything else other than x equal to 0 is just 0. 
and the only thing that counts is the value at f of zero. So these two will be equal to each other if you have f x equals any other value than uh, x equal to zero, and they will still equal to each other when you plug in zero because f of zero delta zero should be f of zero delta zero when x is zero. So you can rewrite it like this, but then if you apply that to this function here, because sine of zero is zero, that's just zero times delta x, so that's in, in that case it's just zero. Okay? So that's the first derivative. And the second derivative in this this time what you have is cosine of x, so cosine of zero is one, so this is what you get. And that means since uh, you've differentiated once and you took this derivative and differentiated it again, that means that the second derivative is uh, equal to this, what we calculated, but that is exactly negative of what we started with. Uh, so this is our original Green's function, and the second derivative of the Green's function gave you negative of the Green's function plus delta x. And that means if you move it to the left side and rewrite it in this format, uh, you're saying that the operator L applied to G is delta x. So uh, another way to put the, the characteristics of a Green's function is it's a function where if you apply that operator, you get the delta function. Now this is actually the entire thing. If you start understanding that Green's functions are functions that pr produce these delta functions, then understanding why convolution with fx and the Green's function produces the solution of this in general is very easy, as you can see here. Uh, if you apply the, the operator L to this, that's like applying this to your integral, where the g is the actual kernel, and because this is the derivative operator with respect to x, it can just go inside and apply to g, but if you apply to g, we, we have established that it gives you the delta function, right? And if it's the delta function, this will be evaluated when x minus t equals to zero, which means when t is zero, and uh, no, when t is x, and therefore you get f of x as the result. So it's very simple if you view it this way. And that's it. Now, I, uh, I think you've understood what a Green's function for an operator L is. Now, um, you might have been watching this video uh, hoping to understand the Green's function for the two-dimensional or three-dimensional Poisson equation, and that involves more multivariable calculus, so I cannot uh, show it in this video, but I hope to uh, show that in a, another video. So uh, if you have this Laplacian operator, this is a two-dimensional Laplacian, and uh, the equation that says Laplacian of u equals the function uh, is called the Poisson equation. And the Poisson equation has the Green's function as 1 over 2 pi ln of r, where r is the square root of x squared plus y squared. Now, if you looked at this and thought polar coordinate system, then you're right. In fact, uh, you get this result by using the polar coordinate system. Okay, and um, what that means is that uh, if you take the function f on the right side and do a convolution, this is two-dimensional convolution. If you do a two-dimensional convolution with the Green's function, this Green's function, of course it's a function of x and y, so you can definitely write it like this, then this will be one solution of the Poisson equation. Of course, because I didn't provide any boundary conditions, this has infinitely many solutions, but uh, this will actually be one particular solution of this one. And uh, then afterwards, you can easily figure out how to get the solution that satisfies the boundary condition. Okay. And for th 3D Poisson equation, uh, this is the 3D Laplacian, and uh, pro pr perhaps this is more uh, famous. Uh, it's negative 1 over 4 pi, 1 over uh, the norm of the vector x, comma y, comma z. So a lot of times people write that Green's function as something like uh, negative 1 over 4 pi, and, uh, you know, r is like a vector, and you put the norm of it. That's, that's how people write it. 
And whenever you see this, you should immediately recognize this as the Green's function for the 3D Poisson equation. And uh, this actually appears a lot in quantum field theory. So uh, if you were reading quantum field theory books and you, you've suddenly uh, found this to be uh, coming out from nowhere, now you know where it comes from, okay? Again, uh, this formula uh, requires uh, even more complicated math, so I hope to uh, make another video for this. Thanks for watching and please subscribe and like.